After researching where exactly Bumbo came from, I wanted to track down who brought those tapes to the thrift store. I could not just go up and demand surveillance footage, obviously, so I used the truth, and hummed it up a bit using my high school drama experience. I went in completely distraught, saying my little brother had gotten sick after something on the cassette of the tape pricked his finger, and I was trying to track down who brought it in so we could help him. I told the owner that he was just a little boy and he was in the hospital deathly ill. Not far off from the truth, if you think about it. Luckily, the owner bought my act and brought me back to his store security room. Basically, it was a closet with a television on a closed circuit with the camera outside at the donation bin. Here he videotaped every donation made to his store in case something stolen showed up and cops wanted help. Or at least that is what he told me to justify this. The owner was one of those uppity nosy types, and while I normally could not stand them, this man's lack of respect for people's privacy helped me. Therefore, I just kept my mouth shut this time. Talking with him a bit seemed that he actually remembered the bumbo tapes I bought, and had a vague idea of where they were dropped off. After about an hour or two of watching people dropping their discarded belongings at the place's drop-off bins, we finally came to the part I needed. A tall, gaunt, old-looking man walked up to the bin. He looked haggard and quite possibly homeless. His hair was long and obviously unwashed, even from the poor resolution on the grainy black-and-white surveillance video. He nervously looked side to side like he was being watched, then pulled out three cassette-looking objects and dropped them into the bin. That's him, the owner said. I remember it being odd as hell. Most homeless men don't have anything to donate. Most people also don't look so paranoid or scared, doing so either unless they have something to hide. I made myself a mental note in case something came of it. He said this was a sort of crooked, perverse smile, as if he was proud of himself for this. I scratched my head for a second, then pressed him on the issue. You were concerned enough to remember the guy, but didn't worry about selling what he dropped off? I guess some anger was showing in my words or on my face despite me trying to hide it, because he looked a bit scared when he responded. Look, man, I don't judge too much on what is donated or who does it. I just make sure whatever it is, it is reasonably clean. Doesn't smell like piss or crap, that's it. If I wanted to get picky, I wouldn't be able to sell anything. I was feeling lightheaded suddenly. Something seemed to be sapping my energy. I leaned back against the wall of the little room he kept his equipment in and tried to stop the world from spinning around me at a dizzying speed. I must have looked pretty pathetic there, since his voice went from scared to concerned. Look, I am sorry about your kid, brother. I really am. Tell you what, I will make you a copy of the tape and you can try to find the guy. I simply nodded since the world was still spinning and that was about all I could do without losing my breakfast there in that tiny room. This had been happening more and more frequently since I started my mission to find out what happened to my little brother, along with the visions of that damned mouse. It took some time to make the copy, but luckily, in the time it took, the world finally seemed to come to a still in my head. I thanked him once he handed me the tape and started to walk out of the store, passing through an aisle of mirrors and large frames along the way. There in one of the larger mirrors stood Bumbo. He was staring straight at me, his cartoonish eyes faintly glowing red. He stood there, arms crossed, looking freakishly intimidating for a black and white 50s cartoon character. I stopped mid-stride, too scared to move. He reached out his hand to the glass, then stopped suddenly, changing his mind then looked up towards the ceiling. He looked back down at me and let out a devilishly large grin. The same grin Justin showed me before he ripped off my finger. Suddenly, the fluorescent bulbs above me shattered, raining glass shards and dust all over me. This snapped me out of my stupor and I walked quickly to the exit. The owner tried to stop and ask if I was okay. I nodded to him, quickly said I was fine and left the store, pulling glass out of my hair along the way. After driving like a man chased by the devil, I arrived back home. I sat the tape down and decided to take a shower to wash the fluorescent bulb dust away and calm down my nerves a bit. While showering, everything from the past few days came rushing back to my mind. I ended up sitting down on the floor, curling up into a ball, crying. I cried for what was happening to my family, cried for my brother, and cried for me. Somehow I had blindly brought this all on my family and that guilt was eating at me. Along with the lightheadedness and Bumbo hauntings, I still kept hearing Justin's voice calling at me, 
asking for help. Sometimes he was scared, screaming for me. Sometimes I heard him laughing, asking me to find him like when we played hide and seek. But it was always his voice there echoing in my head. I was not sure if it's linked to the other two recurring symptoms, or if my conscience was trying to make damn sure I knew I screwed up big time by torturing me every second it got. Believe me though, I knew. After my shower and emotional outburst, I toweled off and dressed in some ripped blue jeans and a plain white t-shirt, then got to work. I played the video to the point the homeless man walked up to the bin. I managed after some trial and error to pause it at the best possible angle I could to get a picture of his face. I then took a picture using my phone's camera and uploaded it to my computer. It was grainy, black and white, and was a picture of a bad picture, but it still gave me some identifying features to the man. I needed to find out who this man was. It was my first and maybe my last source of info that could save my family. Problem was a picture is all I had to go with. It was obvious he had to be homeless based on how dirty and haggard he looked, but that was all I could go on besides long gray or blonde hair and that he was gaunt and wrinkled like a very old man. Luckily, the town, the thrift store was located, did not have a large population, only seven or 8,000. I at least had this small bit of luck in my favor. First, though, I wanted to see if I could find any information online. At least get a name or something to go on, maybe an old newspaper article or something from when he was younger. I uploaded his picture to an image search engine, and since it was a low-quality picture, I got a lot of hits. 500-plus pages, to be exact. I started going through the result pages, one picture after another. It was hours later before I was even a third the way done, and already every image seemed to blur together. I leaned back in my chair, rubbing my eyes to give them a break from the computer's glow, and then stood up. I saw a flitter of movement out of the corner of my eye. Odd. The only thing there was the television. I had left the tape paused. There should not have been movement on the screen. It was hard to tell at first, but yeah, the screen would flash completely white for a second and then go back to the image of the homeless man. It was just like the bumbo tape. I shook my head and moved closer to the TV, and it was then I saw a small black figure on the screen behind the homeless man. It kept growing, bit by bit, and was bobbing up and down a bit in some rhythm. After a few moments, I could make out what the black shape was and my heart seemed to sink into my stomach. It was bumbo. He was walking towards the screen, walking in his bizarre dance walk he did on his tape. He was whistling along to a song only he heard, without sound coming from his lips. At first, I thought my mind was just playing a trick on me. He had always appeared on mirrors, not in the television. I was completely wrong in that assumption, though. After a little bit, he walked right up to the frozen image of the homeless man. He jumped up and sat on the man's shoulders, then leaned back against the man's head and crossed his arms. One leg dangled down, swaying slightly over his shoulder. He just sat there, watching me. I moved a bit to my right, and his eyes followed me. I moved a bit to the left, and again he followed me. I stole a glance to my left where the chair was that I left the remote on. I looked back at Bumbo, who looked at me and shook his head, silently telling me not to do what I was thinking of doing. Screw it. I decided and rushed towards the chair. With a roar that seemed to shake the entire house, Bumbo's face emerged from the TV. Only it was not the friendly animated face from the TV. He was grotesquely deformed. His skin was stretched and looked like the old leather pulled tight over an object far too big for it. There were rips in the leathery mask of his face, exposing decaying green flesh, with white maggots and worms crawling on and through the skin. His eyes were bloodshot and yellow with jaundice. As he roared, the smell of death and decay filled the house like a corpse wrapped in sewage waste and left to bake in the sun for days. He was missing teeth in his cavernous maw, and what teeth he did have were yellowed or black with decay. They were also cracked and broken like a man who has not brushed his teeth in a decade. He looked over to my direction and grew larger by the second. He wasted no time lunging at me, aiming to bite my head off into its gangrenous maw. I threw myself forward towards the chair, but misjudged the distance and crashed right into the chair. The remote fell off to the floor from the impact and bounced further away from me on the carpet. I scrambled to get up to my feet as Bumble's arms emerged out from the television, reaching towards me. It was in the same state as his face, leathery skin, holes torn into the skin, and it was oozing a green, viscous fluid from open rips in the skin.
along the ground where his putrescent fluid hit my carpet, it plopped down, leaving maggots and viscera pooled there. I managed to get some of my footing back and jumped towards the remote. I desperately lashed to grab the remote and did at the same time rolled with the movement to come out facing the television. Bumbo stopped moving, his arm sliding back to the television and whatever hell he came from. You think finding me will save your brother? He spoke, craning his head to look at me. His voice was like two different people speaking at once. A deep, bone-chilling, demonic voice. The same one I heard Justin utter when he wanted me to not touch the VCR before liberating my finger from its brethren. And Justin's voice. He laughed at my reaction to my brother's voice mixed with his demonic one. You don't have to keep suffering like this. Your brother. He misses you dearly. He calls out for you constantly. He wishes you were with him. He does not understand why you left him alone. We can fix that, though. All you have to do is watch the tape again, and you can be with all of your family again. One happy family together again. As he spoke, I too could hear in the back of my mind Justin calling out for me again. Bubba, where are you? Come get me, Bubba. I am scared. Oh, God. It was not just me losing my mind from grief. Justin was still alive somewhere within whatever hell Bumbo came from, and worse, I had put him there. Images of him playing, reaching up at me to be picked up. Him playing and several other of his childish activities all swarmed through my head, and the room started spinning. I heard his voice calling out to me, the deeper demonic voice of Bumbo laughing the entire time in the background. It felt like the world was collapsing in on me. Darkness and misery came slowly, sinking into reality to swallow me. I was definitely losing my mind. Somehow he was making me lose what was left of my sanity. I could feel it creeping away as the shadows around crept closer. Part of me, somewhere, was calling out to me to listen like a faint whisper. It cried out for me to hit the power button on the remote. It told me that is all I had to do and I would be safe from him. All I had to do was just hit the button. I brought my hands up to my head, trying to hold in the feeling of my brain exploding out from all that was happening now. The voices, the cries, the shadows, it was all converging in, and it felt like as it was encroaching in, my brain was pushing out. I just wanted to hold it together, hold it in place for a bit longer, and I must have pushed the button when I clenched my head in pain. The power of the television shut off, and almost instantly the image of Bumbo shattered into a million shards of glass, falling to the ground like dust from that fluorescent bulb in the thrift store. With that, the madness that was encroaching in me vanished. The world was back again, and I could not hear Justin's voice, or Bumbo's, just my heart beating inside my head. I sat there in silence, in shock, honestly. I could not tell you how much time passed, or even if I thought at all in that time. I just remember having a hard time thinking, hard time pushing all my thoughts together into some sort of comprehensible picture. An uncontrollable number of minutes later, I rose to my feet, grabbed my shoes, and put them on. I then grabbed my phone, my wallet, my keys, and tossed a black hoodie over the t-shirt I was wearing, and started to leave the house, then stopped myself with a shake of my head. I walked over to where I had put the pistol I bought in my depression, and slid it in between my pants and my t-shirt. It hid well enough under my hoodie, luckily. I also grabbed my pocket knife and shoved it into my pocket. All of this I did in a sort of thoughtless stupor, not really knowing what I was doing. Somehow, in that mindless span of time, my subconscious came to the decision before I actually did. I was going to find that homeless man now. I was going to get answers I needed, and I was going to save Justin. That, or I was making that mouse bastard pay. I was on a mission. After everything that has happened, I was out for blood. I did not have a lot to go on. A cryptic history of nightmarish proportions and a homeless man. That was it. I felt like I was flying blind here, but at least I was still flying. After leaving my house, Bumbo never left me. As I drove here, he was in the back seat, grinning his creepy large grin, sitting in the back seat as if it was perfectly normal. He would then be in other people's cars, waving at me, or mock killing the driver or riders. He would not leave me alone. He didn't attack me, though. I don't know why. He had every chance in the world, and based on what I saw in my living room, he had the ability to. 
It was an agonizingly long drive to the town where I got the tapes, Bumbo enjoying his mental torture the entire time. By the time I pulled up to the first place I was going to check, he was in the back seat laughing at me. I could not hear him. Thank God for small miracles. But you could tell he was having the time of his life. Let him laugh for now, or I was coming for him. My first destination was the public library. The town's library was a common gathering place for the town's homeless. It was warm in the winter, cool in the summer, and had a large gazebo on the property that made a dry place to sleep during a storm. It had just started to sprinkle, the sky a darkening gray from the clouds and the approaching night. There was already two people in the gazebo. They had curled up next to a large barrel on fire for warmth. One was very dirty and shaggy-looking old man. He had a long white beard and it was caked with the dirt and grime from his hard life. The other was a actually kind of attractive redhead young woman. It looked like she hadn't been homeless very long, but she gave deference to the old man. So I got the impression, without any words, needing spoken, he was looking out for her. The streets could not be the safest place for a young woman, I guessed. Excuse me? I walked up to them, hands out, in a gesture showing I was unarmed. Yeah? What do you need, son? The man responded to me. His voice was deep, expressed his age with it, but had kindness in it. It had a weird way of putting me at ease as he spoke. A little. I am looking for someone. Have you seen this man? I held out my phone with the picture of the homeless man I was searching for opened and on the screen. He examined the picture then spit off into the distance, making it off the gazebo into the bushes nearby. Yeah, I might. Why are you looking for him? He stared at me with an intense glare over the fire barrel. The light from the fire and the surrounding shadows gave him a sinister appearance. Part of me wanted to just run away. I was worried either Bumbo would find a way to attack them because of me, or was already affecting him. I did not know how far his reach had gone, but since it was a homeless man that dropped off the tapes originally, it was still possible others were in league with him. Fighting that instinct with memories of Justin and the Bumbo that came out of my television, I pushed past the fear to go on with the conversation. He dropped off some tapes to a thrift store a while ago, and I was trying to find out where they came from. It's really important to my kid brother I find out more about them. He is a huge Bumbo fan now. I said the last with some obvious regret in my voice. Something in the old man softened when I told him that. He had a knowing look then, as if he knew exactly what I was actually meaning. Those tapes, huh? Yeah, I told Abe he needed to destroy those damn things. He was always carting them around. He never let us watch them, though, even when we were able to borrow a TV and VCR at the library. He would always freak out and hide them saying it was too dangerous. Never did know why he was so scared of us watching them. We wouldn't steal from one of our own, he said, giving a sad glance to his younger ward. Tell you what, son, have a seat. He patted the wooden bench of the gazebo. Let's have a chat. Abe will likely be coming by at some point. With this coming storm, he will be here soon enough. Not many other places around for us to go during times like this. I took a seat at the bench with him, and after a bit of surprisingly comfortable silence, he started again. Never did catch your name, son. I'm Thestus, though everyone around here just calls me Santa. He reached out his hand to shake. Nice to meet you, Fest- er, Santa. My name's Edward. We grasped hands and shook a few times and then parted. He reached over and placed his hand on the girl's shoulder. This is Emmy. She's like my grandkid. I knew her parents before I left the civilized world for this paradise. He said with her sarcastic tone. After her parents died, she didn't have anywhere else to go. The streets are not the safest place. But with old Santa watching out for her, no one messes with her. You'd be surprised, Eddie. We don't have much out here. But we have family. And that's all we need. I nodded in silence, not exactly sure what to say, or why he was so free with such personal information. He was in the reflection of the library's windows. Oddly, he looked strangely calm in that window. He didn't make the threatening gestures or actions like he did on the ride here. And he just stood staring at me. No smile on his face, just a cold indifference. If I did not know better... I would have said he looked more like one of those window cutouts places used for decoration, more than a demonic mouse spirit that possessed my brother and tried to kill me. 
I did know better, though, and I was not sure what he was planning, but his calmness scared me more than anything else has. It still does. I did not know why then, and uh, now I really wish I didn't know. Emmy sat silent still, staring at the fire with a detached look on her face, as if she was not here with us. She had to be over 18, since she was here on the streets instead of with the state as a minor would be. I didn't know how much older than 18 she was, but I will not lie, she was seriously cute. Even despite the crusted, dirty clothes, matted hair, and soil-splotched face, I could tell. I felt completely sorry for that girl. It was obvious the loss of her parents still affected her. I could empathize. Her parents haven't been gone long. Santa interrupted the silence, looking over at Emmy with a pained look. It's only been a few months. They didn't leave anything for her, and the bank didn't much care about kicking a barely 18 young lady on the street to fend for herself. It's disgusting, is what it is. I knew her dad from our old military days. Even despite my glamorous lifestyle, I would still always have a warm meal and couch at their place when I needed it. They offered me a room there, but I would not hear of it. I ain't no charity case. So, when I found out about their accident and found Emmy out on the street with nothing but the clothes on her back, I took her in. Been making sure she's fed and safe. I owe her dad that much. I was honestly surprised. Despite having so little, he still gave freely to this girl. He had no obligation to. It was honestly touching. I honestly doubted I knew anyone else that would do this sort of thing. I didn't even know if I would have for anyone but Justin. The image of him chasing down his favorite ball and tossing it back to me came to mind. He was so important to me, and this is what he got for me caring about him. I had to make this right. Your kid brother watched his tapes, didn't he? Santa interrupted the silence again. I nodded, unable to speak at that moment. I knew someday someone else would suffer because of those damn tapes. Abe used to tell us about them, about Bumbo. About where he came from. Fucking disgusting. What they did to those kids down there. Hope that Nazi son of a bitch rots in hell for it. He spat again, more in disgust than necessity that time. He always spoke about that mouse with fear and paranoia. He never was right in the head. At least since I knew him. But he was worse when he mentioned those tapes. Or that damn mouse. He would often hide them, or repeatedly pat his bag to make sure they were still there. It was like he was scared of losing them, but was also scared of having them. Never could make much sense of it. He spit again off into the bushes. He told me he saw Bumbo everywhere in the windows. That he was always watching him, stalking him. I thought it was all in his head. We all have our demons and skeletons in our closets. Until he woke up one day with cuts all around his face, and broken glass all around him, that is. It was then I started trying to convince him to get rid of him. You mean Bumble attacked him too? I asked. Yup. Apparently, one night, that mouse attacked. Didn't kill him, but cut his face up pretty mean. Had hoped getting rid of those tapes might help, you know, there's always stories of ghosts and demons haunting objects. Thought this was one of those things. He couldn't burn him, though. He was in complete fear when it was brought up. I finally convinced him to throw them out at least. He said, holding his hands out to the fire for warmth. It was starting to rain harder now, and the clack of thunder rolled off over in the distance. The setting was getting darker and darker every minute. It was like the darkness was creeping in on us, and only the light of this fire kept its inky tendrils from grabbing us and swallowing us into that inky abyss. I shuddered a bit, to myself, fear again settling in. I could not see Bumbo anymore. It was too dark to see the windows clearly now. I knew he was there, though. Somehow, I knew. A flash of lightning lit the area for a second, and there, where the window was, was a figure. It was moving towards us slowly. That'll be Abe. About time, Abe. He shouted out the last part. There was no response, though, just the sound of heavy rain and an approaching raspy breathing. Abe. You okay, brother? Santa called out again, concern rising in his tone. My god, 
What happened? He called out as he stood up and started to move over to him. He made it a few steps before the figure came into the light. It was the same man I saw in the surveillance video, but something was different. He had a distinct look in his eyes, and they were milky white. He just stared forward, like he didn't see us. He was bleeding heavily, his face cut up, and blood dripped down from his hands. The cause of the cuts was there in one of his hands. It was a large shard of broken mirror, easily bigger than your average pocket knife, and he just clenched it, apparently ignorant of the pain, or the blood flowing freely from his hand. He cocked his head to the side in a bone-chilling familiar way, before he lunged with the shard of glass and slit Santa's throat in a quick movement. Santa didn't even have time to recognize what was happening before he was on the ground sputtering blood. Emmy screamed. Apparently the attack had shook her from her grief-caused fugue. She started to run towards Santa, but I reached out and kept her back, pushing her behind me defensively. I reached into my pocket and pulled out my pocket knife. I should have pulled out my gun, but I didn't know if I could save him somehow. This would have been a good test to see if I could save Justin and the rest of my family from Bumbo's influence. He stared straight at me, with milky white eyes. He kept his head cocked to the side with an all-too-familiar grin on his face. For what seemed like an eternity, he just stared at me. Didn't move. Aside from a spastic twitch in an arm or his free hand or a tick in his face here or there. He looked as if he was studying me or taking in the terror from the scene and feeding off it. He cocked his head to the other side and then spoke. What's the matter, Eddie? You didn't think I could hurt you since I didn't through the glass? He chuckled a little. I have always been able to hurt you. Always been able to get you. And it's just been more fun to play with you. Your brother is still waiting for you, Ed. Waiting for you to come help him. He's here with me. Crying. Scared. He smiled wider. The lips of the homeless man splitting at the corners from strain. He spoke out again, but with a more familiar voice. Bubba, please come, I'm scared. Justin's voice. He was speaking in Justin's voice. No hint of his or the homeless man's voice, purely Justin's. My innocent little brother's voice with his W's instead of R's. It was unquestionably my little brother's voice. It's dark. It's scary. Everything hurts. Bubba, please make it stop, please. He cried out louder. His fear and pain echoed through his words. Tears formed in my eyes. My heart felt like it was breaking inside my chest. My God, Justin did not deserve this. He didn't deserve anything like this. Let him go. I screamed out at him. More pain than anger at the moment. He's just a child. If you want someone so bad, come take me. I'll trade you, me, for my family. He looked genuinely surprised for a moment. Then his smile grew even wider, growing the stress tears in the homeless man's cheeks. He made a tisk-tisk sound while shaking his head side to side. Ed, don't you know? Cartoons are for kids. Take Abe here, or Abel as he was called before. I have been with him for years, decades, ever since he was a child. He has always belonged to me, as Justin does now. Your other family members, they're dead. I can just make them look alive, act like it for everyone else. I can make them my puppets, my toys. They were useless to me, so I threw their souls out of their bodies and into hell. I am sure they are enjoying their damnation down there. What is the best part of all this is it's because you put them there. He let out a laugh in his demonic voice. It sent chills up my spine, and I felt my heart beat in my head. Heard it in my ears. I was terrified. Something about his voice sent fear coursing through me. It was all I could do to stand there looking at him. They are waiting for you too, Eddie boy, so let's not keep them waiting any longer, huh? His movements were stiff, reminding me of a marionette puppet on strings. He walked slowly towards me in jittery, spastic movements. I walked out to meet him, giving space between Emmy and myself, along with a possessed former friend of hers. He lashed out with a shard of glass aimed at my throat. I barely had time to get my arm up to protect it, and the glass sliced through my left forearm, spraying a bit of blood after it in a stream. Emmy screamed and took off away from the gazebo into the storm. Good, I could not keep watching her anymore with this right now. I didn't honestly know if I was going to make it through this. I could not worry about that, though. He lashed out again, and this time I was able to jump back before the razor shard glass sliced through me. As soon as I landed on my feet, I jumped forward, tackling the man to the ground. As we landed, he sank the shard under my shoulder. It hurt like all hell, but now I started to get adrenaline flowing in me. And with that and the anger that had been festering in me since all this started, I was able to push the pain out of my mind. He stabbed the shard into me again, and this time a little higher on my shoulder. I honestly didn't even feel it that time. 
As he moved his hand again to stab down, I reached out and pinned it to the ground. I pinned his head down to the ground with my other arm. I still had my knife in the hand of the arm I was using to pin his neck to the ground, and I was fighting the urge to slit his neck and end this, and hopefully Bumbo too. Give me my brother back, I yelled and slammed my forehead into the man's face, breaking his nose. He looked up at me, still grinning the far too big of grin for his face, and blood trailed down from his broken nose. He is mine. He is always mine now. I will need a new shell after this one passes, and he will do just fine. He laughed while we struggled there. I slammed my head back down into his face to silence his laugh, and it just altered the laugh. My headbutt had broken a few teeth in his mouth, since he was still grinning with all his brown, rotten teeth out to the world. It was then I knew I could not save him. I could not get Bumbo's claws out of this man's mind. He was too long gone if he could ignore everything that was happening now. He looked up at me with his milky white eyes and smiled one last time, before he stuck out his tongue and bit it off. As he did, the milky white eyes regained their brown color. He looked panicked and pure fear radiated from his eyes before he passed away from either blood loss or suffocation on his own blood. That look of fear still etched on his face. There wasn't anything I could do for him. Nothing I could have done to save him. And that realization hit me like a punch to the gut. What about Justin? Was there still time for him? I could see Bumbo in that shard of mirror that now fell to the ground. He was laughing at me, at the man he killed so carelessly. I stood up, staring at Bumbo the entire time in that blood-covered shard. With a scream, more in frustration and anger at myself than at the demon inside, and smashed my foot into it. It shattered beneath my heel, and as it did, the windows of the library shattered, spraying chunks of thick safety glass out into the courtyard of the library. A loud demonic roar erupted from shattering glass as it flew through the air. I covered my face with my hands and ducked down to the ground as thick chunks of glass rained down on me. After what seemed like forever, the rain of glass stopped, and the roar stopped. I rose up to my feet, shaking off the chunks of glass best I could. Somehow, I escaped all that with a few small cuts to my arms. I was in a bit of shock, looking around, confused, but snapped out of it quickly as Emmy ran over to me. What the hell was that? she asked, speaking out for the first time. That... that was Bumbo. I responded with a heavy sigh still brushing glass shards off my shirt. He killed Festus. He killed Abe. My God, why? Why did all of my family have to be taken from me? She broke out in tears and sat on the ground, pulling her legs to her chest and wrapping her legs around them. She sobbed for some time, and I didn't interrupt her. I honestly didn't know what to say to her. She had lost her parents, and now had lost her second family. This time, because of me. Because of Bumbo. Look, we can't stay here. Someone had to hear all that glass shattering, if not the roar. They will call the cops if someone hasn't already. I can't offer much, but you're welcome to sleep on my bed. I'll take the couch. I have warm food and you're welcome to shower too. And I know I have spare clothes from an ex somewhere. She looked up at me, and despite the tears and pain on her face, her eyes had a determined look to them. Are you going after him? She said, then rubbed her nose against her sleeve. Yeah, I have to. My brother is still being possessed by him, and I still have to figure out how to save him and kill that cartoon. She nodded, then said, I'm going with you. I must have still been in some state of shock from the fight, because all I could say is, What? She stood up and stared at me, wiping the tears from her eyes. He killed the only family I have left. I have nothing left. I have no one. I want to make that mouse pay. She said, defiantly stamping her foot to the ground to emphasize her point. I started to object, but had a feeling no matter what I said, I was going to lose this argument. Instead of saying no like I wanted to, like I should have, like my mind was screaming out in my head, I said okay, but first we get a shower, some food, and rest. I'm really beat. We walked over to my car, glass crunching beneath our shoes as we did. I pulled out from the library parking lot and drove back to my apartment. Surprisingly, the entire trip I did not see Bumbo. Not once. I was in an empty hallway. Doors dotted the walls, with numbers faded and unrecognizable. I couldn't see much in front of me. It looked like a pulsating darkness that only moved back as I stepped forward. All around me, Justin's laughter or screams would echo. I could tell from where, though. It seemed like it was everywhere, and nowhere, all at once. I scrambled about, opening door after door. Behind every door was some horrible scene. 
One had a man hanging from a noose, crows pecking at his milky white eyes. He would moan slightly in pain, but never moved. The next had a man in a tattered lab coat tied to a table, and little demons the size of children were slowly carving off pieces and eating. After a few moments, the wound would mend and the demons would cut again. Each room progressively got worse. It was as if I was looking into the private hell of every person that died. Scene after scene of torture, pain, violence, it was overwhelming. Pleas for help or to end it echoed out with Justin's own calls. I shook my head and continued. I couldn't let these people's misery distract me. I made it through countless visions of hell, until I opened the door and froze. My father was there. Not my stepdad. My real one. He was in a car, sealed tight with the exhaust funneling into it. He would beat at the doors and windows, eventually breaking one. He attempted to climb out, only to have the glass grow back around him and force him back into the car. Bloodied, but whole as he fell back into the car. It repeated this cycle countlessly. No, no, I didn't mean for this. I didn't want this. Help, someone help, is all he said. I don't know if he could see me, and I didn't know if I wanted him to. This cemented my idea about this being hell. It was. He had killed himself five years ago in a similar fashion to the hell he lived now. I shut the door hesitantly and sat back against it once in the hall again. What the hell was this? I raised my hands to my head, covering my face in my growing tears. It was then Justin's cry echoed out again in the unnoticed silence before. Bubba, help! I don't want to be here anymore! Putting my sadness aside, I stood to my feet and rushed forward. I don't know how I knew, but I knew he was ahead. I ran straight into the shadows. They seemed to snake out in tendrils, wrapping around my arms and legs. But I would tear at them and rip them away, to have them evaporate into wisps of smoke in the air. This struggle continued for what seemed like forever. The tendrils seemed to dig and tear into my arms and legs each time. I felt them cut into me, but couldn't stop. I continued forward through the blackness. I would heal. I didn't care how tore up I got. I was going to get Justin out of this. What seemed like hours later, I tore through the wall of shadows, collapsing for a second in exhaustion. I was bloody, hurting, and out of breath. My arms were tore up bad, looking like a layer of bleeding hamburger meat than the flesh they were before I dove into that mess. My legs were about the same. With the exception of a few scrapes of jean denim blood caked and glued to the wounds, I struggled to stand, and failed the first couple of times. But another of Justin's screams motivated me past the pain I was feeling and got me right up again. I took off again, forward down a strange corridor. I couldn't tell you too much of what it looked like. I didn't have time to examine closer. I can tell you it was a dark gray, and every so often glowing runs interrupted the otherwise dull gray surroundings. I ran, and ran, and ran. My lungs were on fire, every inch of me hurt, and I was losing blood fast. I didn't know exactly how much I had lost, but I was starting to get slightly lightheaded, and I knew that wasn't good. Just when it felt like my lungs were going to collapse, if I pushed them further, the corridor ended. I tried to stop myself, sliding on the smooth floor, barely managing to grab the wall to slow down my momentum. I stopped right at the edge of the hall, and a huge pit. It was dark, too dark even for the shadows. The only light came from the center of the pit where there, lit by torches, was Justin. He was in a cage of bone. He didn't look hurt from what I could tell. He was just curled up in a ball crying. <sighs> I had to go get him. I looked around and realized growing from the shadows were dull gray stairs. They led right to him. Ignoring the crying out in my head that this was a trap, I ran down the stairs. I ran faster than I should have, honestly. The momentum almost took me a few times but managed to stay on my feet somehow. Justin saw me coming and stood up reaching out to me. Bubba! Bubba! He cried out. His face was tear-streaked, and his eyes were bloodshot. As I made it to his platform, inky dark tendrils wrapped my arms and lifted me up into the air. No, you aren't stopping me! I called out to the dark abyss and pulled my arm close enough to where I could bite at the tendrils, where I bit, just evaporated, but the rest of it remained locked in place. It tasted like ash in my mouth, and I gagged a bit, but continued to bite at the tendrils until another came and wrapped around my head, holding it in place and choking me slightly. Two more came from nowhere and wrapped around my legs. I was stuck in place fast. I couldn't pull or move to get any movement from any limb. Laughter echoed around me from everywhere. I watched as the form of my little brother shifted and blurred in shadow to Bumbo's. He laughed at me and simply stepped through the bones of the cage that held Justin. He walked towards me slowly, 
not stopping his laughter until he was close enough to me that I could see his patched, old leathery face. He still had the maggot-filled holes from when he attacked me through the TV, and they had seemed to grow wider, or at least looked that way to me. I have told you before, Edward. He is mine. You should give up on this stupid suicide mission you are on. I have never lost a child, and I won't now. Your brother is as good as dead, you simpleton. Now leave. He waved his hand dismissively and turned his back to me. I won't, you monster. I yelled as I lunged at him, though completely futile. I'm going to get Justin out of your demonic fingers, and you are going back to hell where you belong. He stopped walking and looked over his shoulder at me. His eyes weren't the cartoonish style they were a second ago. They were black, with red pupils, and they glowed a crimson light from them. And no, Edward, you won't. His voice had gone deeper, and behind it was a menacing anger that sent chills down my spine. You were just a foolish human that fell into my trap like the rest, and ignorantly consigned his brother to be my newest shell. Your brother is as good as dead, and he will stay here. He pointed back to the cage where the shadows moved and swirled to show my little brother sleeping on the cage floor. You will die, and I will continue to use him until his body is broken and useless, and then I'll find another. The tendril wrapped around my throat harder. I couldn't breathe in its vice-like cold grip. Bumbo turned to face me and closed his hands as if clapping for a second. The tendrils gripped tighter onto me. I could feel my arms snapping like twigs and pain rushed over me. I screamed out and he laughed. He separated his hands and the tendrils pulled at me. Slowly I could feel my arms and legs dislocate from their joints. It was agonizing. I screamed out in pain, but despite the screams, I continued to hear Bumbo's laughter. I felt my arms and legs rip away from me, and I hung there choking in the tendril's grasp. It clenched around my neck, and I felt a pop, and everything went black. I woke up in a cold sweat, screaming. I looked around and realized I was in my room. My sheets were soaked in sweat, as well as my entire body. I looked like I had just gotten out of the shower or something. It was freezing cold in my room, so cold I could see my breath. I checked my arms and legs and they were fine, no cuts still attached, only the finger Justin had ripped away, missing. I looked up from my hands to see Bumbo in the mirror. He was back in his full cartoon form, laughing at me in a silent, mocking way. I reached over to my nightstand and grabbed the first thing I could find, a book I was reading trying to find information on demons and voodoo. I threw it at the mirror and it shattered. Bumbo faded into countless silver pieces and I just sat there, shivering and terrified. Emmy rushed in from the living room, having slept on the couch. She was dressed in one of my t-shirts, which barely covered past the top of her legs. I couldn't enjoy the view, though. I continued to try to catch my breath and slow my quickly beating heart. What the hell happened? she asked, and concerned and scared. I shook my head at her and tried to gather my thoughts. When I had managed to grasp onto a few of my mental facilities, I uttered the word Bumbo. She sighed deeply, sat back against the wall and slid to the floor. What the hell are we going to do, Ed? I shrugged and stood up. Honestly, I don't know. I looked over to my alarm clock. It was 4 a.m. I think, though, my first step is going to ask at some churches, synagogues, and every other place I can think of. See how I can get that mouse out of my brother and send him back to hell. I grabbed some clean jeans, hoodie, and boxers from my dresser and started to head out the door to the bathroom. Emmy stopped me by standing in the way. She leaned in and kissed me on the lips. After it was over, I pulled back and looked at her. What was that for? She smiled slightly and said, Because I wanted to, and because I'm coming with you into the shower. Oh? Is all I managed to stammer out in response. The fourth one. Seriously, the fourth pastor I have spoke to about this. The first three just looked at me like I was crazy, telling me I had to be imagining things and to get help from a counselor. One offered to baptize me, saying it would help drive the demons away from my mind. To be honest, I thought about that one. Maybe Bumbo was in my head. Not in Justin. No, it wouldn't make sense then, given all that's happened. Sadly, this situation is all too real and all too serious. That brings me to right now. I'm sitting in the office of a Baptist pastor. I asked him about demonic possession, and he was going on in a similar sermon that the other three have gone into. There's no such thing of it anymore. That this has to be some sort of phase with Justin, or that I'm reading far too into it. That things always look bad if I let my imagination run. It is honestly all I can do not to roll my eyes and walk out. An hour later, I'm thanking him for his time and walking out. Man, four down, eight to go. Not sure why I have 12 churches in this town, but I guess I wouldn't get it not being a religious person. Maybe given I have come face to face with a demon a handful of times lately, I should convert. 
Yeah, but not on my list of priorities right now. If some higher power wants to help me through this and help me save my little brother, I will gladly convert. Walking out of the church, I see Emmy leaning against a streetlight, dressed in the jeans and the hoodie I bought for her before we started this waste of time. She had just finished smoking a cigarette and flicked it to the ground, stepping on it to snuff the embers out. Any luck, Ed? She calls out seeing me. No, another hour-long sermon on how our minds can play tricks on us and advice to seek a mental health professional. I replied, pulling my keys out of my pocket. She walked over and kissed me on the cheek, before climbing into the car door I held open for her. I walked over to the driver's side and opened the door, then entered the car myself. Inside, I took a second to lay my head back against the headrest and take a deep breath. <sighs> what did I get myself into? I asked aloud, not really expecting an answer, more just voicing a rhetorical question. You didn't do anything. Look, I have been biting my tongue on this since you offered me a place to stay, and more, but I can't anymore. You've been blaming yourself for all of this, but you can't. You didn't know this would happen. You didn't even know that Bumbo existed. The only people to blame are the people who created those tapes, and those prick scientists that experiment on kids until they got it right. Seriously, stop blaming yourself, Ed. The world doesn't belong on your shoulders any more than it belongs on anyone else's. I sighed. She was right. I knew she was right. I understood that, but I couldn't accept it. Regardless of how many times I told myself I didn't know, that I couldn't know, I think of Justin and how things were before, and that guilt kicks in again. I know, you are completely right, Em. I gave my best fake smile I could muster and started the car. Let's go grab some lunch before we visit the next place. What sounds good? She raised her eyebrow for a second, then shrugged. We can eat wherever. I have spent months eating out of the dumpster and living off of people's scraps. Compared to that, McDonald's feels like a feast. I internally cringed, hating what she had been put through. No person deserves to go through what she has. And because of my intervention, she lost the only other people she called family that she had left. I was starting to feel like I was the cursed one, and I was the one that caused misfortune to anyone unlucky enough to cross my path. You have that look again, Ed. She reached over and flicked my forehead. Knock it off, and let's go, okay? I nodded my head and put the car into drive. After eating, we made our way to two more of the churches in town. More of the same responses are all we got. Apparently, despite talking about them every Sunday, not a single pastor I met would admit demons existed, or knew how to get rid of one. We had called it quits for the day, and decided to burn off some steam at the gym. We went our separate ways there for a while, M wanting to go onto the treadmill, and I made my way to the punching bags they had in a room reserved for boxing. My first bit of luck today. The room was empty. I strapped on my gloves and walked up to the bag. I struck out with my left fist first. It was still tender having had a finger ripped out of it, but in a way it felt good, sort of like wiggling a bad tooth. It hurts in a good way. As I rhythmically hit the bag, my mind went blank for a while. Cross, jab, hook, jab, cross. The repetition felt good, in a way. I had control here. My muscles warmed up quickly, and I started to strike faster, then harder. Before I realized it, I was in a sort of a trance. All I knew was punching the bag, and that was all that mattered right now. I don't know how long I was there, punching and practicing my movements, dodging imaginary strikes, then countering with my own strikes. Hit after hit, dodge after dodge, I lost myself in the movements, in the peace of the routine. Then out of nowhere, Bumbo's face emerged out of the bag. I jumped back startled and he stretched further out from it. His face was the color of the bag, like he was using it to make his form. Hello again, Edward, he said in his deep, malice-soaked voice. What are you doing here? I responded with, raising my fists up to defend myself. He laughed with a sound that seemed to echo off the walls of the room I was in, creating a chorus of deep, horrific laughter. You think you could stand against me in combat? Have you seen every time that you try that you cannot win? Did your death in my realm not teach you? I raised my eyebrow a bit at that last line. Oh? He tilted his head slightly. You think that was just a dream? The depths of human ignorance never seems to end. No, you died. At least part of you did. I can't keep a human soul in my realm if I don't possess them or control them, so you were able to escape my realm with most of your soul intact. It was enough for you to keep going on, though you probably lost a few years on your life from that. Not that it really matters given what you have gotten yourself into. Old age is hardly your concern now, is it? He chuckled a bit at this, a deep, guttural, unholy sound. This aside, make no mistake, Edward. You have died before, and you have somehow got another chance. I don't know why, but it won't happen again. The next time I kill you, I'll be feasting on your soul forever. Like how your brother is now. 
He smiled a wolfish smile again. The normal flat cartoonish teeth he had now had sharp points, reminding me he was a demon through and through. Before I realized what I was doing, I struck out and caught him under his chin with an uppercut. He roared in pain, so loud I thought the room was shaking. An arm extended from the bag to rub his chin where I struck. That actually hurt. That's it. I'm done playing around with you. He reached out that extended hand to grab me, but I rolled out of the way then used the momentum to get back to my feet, and I was running towards the door within a second of rolling. He lashed his hand out at me, but I jumped forward, hitting the push bar for the door in air and threw the door all in one movement. Emmy must have heard the commotion, and the moment I burst through the door, she started to push it closed. Bumbo was pushing against the door, and she was struggling to close it. After landing and getting to my feet, I ran over and slammed my shoulder into the door. We finally overpowered him and got the door shut. He roared in frustration, the walls of the entire building shaking violently. Then it stopped, as suddenly as it started. I cracked the door open and looked, to see he was gone. Just the punching bag had remained, swaying slightly on the chain it hung from on the ceiling. I shut the door again, put my back against it and slid down to sit on the floor. I furiously tore off the boxing gloves and threw them across the room in a roar of frustration. What the hell do you want? Haven't you taken enough from me? I roared the last part out, like I was calling it out to him wherever he was. Emmy sat down next to me and grabbed my hand in hers. Ed, think about it. He doesn't leave you alone. He doesn't stop trying to kill you. Why would he do that? Why waste the effort? I sank my head down in surrender. I honestly don't know him. I have nothing more he can take from me. I am nothing. She squeezed my hand hard enough for me to wince. How can someone that has survived so many encounters with a supposed demon from hell be so absolutely clueless? I looked up at her, clearly confused. He is scared of you, you big idiot. I was in shock hearing that. You have to be kidding me, Em. He is scared of me? She nodded almost sagely. Think about it. You haven't given up trying to find a way to get Justin from him. You have hunted down his past. You hunted down Abe. You have gone to pastors, libraries, everywhere to find out how to stop him. I bet no one has done that before. He doesn't know what to do. Something tells me he knows he is vulnerable, and he doesn't want you to know. It's like the insecure bully in school. Dang, she was right. She was completely right. It made sense for the first time. I always struggled with why he was torturing me, following me, trying to kill me. It was because he knew I could take him down. Somehow. I was either on the right path, or already possessed the ability to get him. While thinking those thoughts, something hit me like a freightliner. I was able to hurt him in there. When he showed himself, I instinctively hit him, and it worked. He even said it hurt. Her eyes went big for a second, then she smiled. That's it, Ed. For whatever reason, you are what he is afraid of. Every book in old religious tale tells us demons are some immortal creatures, only vulnerable to angels and God. That they are the opposite end of the coin for those divine things. She took a second to let that sink in, then continued, but you can hurt him. You have been able to follow him, to learn about him to hunt him. He is in prey, but neither are you at this point. You haven't given up despite the crap that you have been through because of him. You are his predator, the same as he is yours. You two are like two tigers, circling each other, both waiting for one of you to strike. We need to make sure you strike, and you win. She made perfect sense. I honestly couldn't believe I didn't see this sooner. I had more of an idea what to do now. I stood up and kissed Emmy deeply. When we were done, I pulled away from her a bit and told her, You are a certifiable genius. She shook her head and smiled beneath the curls of red hair that had covered her face as she blushed. No, Edward, you are just slow. Anyone could have seen this. For such a kind person, you got some serious deficiencies in the brain department. I can't believe I fell for an idiot. She stomped herself and covered her face in her hands at that. I kind of stood shocked for a second and scratched my head. Well, let's leave that for when this is all over, huh? We have a few more pastors to see tomorrow, and with luck, a cartoon to kill. Let's get home. I could use a shower and some rest. She reached out and grabbed my hand. You can have the shower, but tonight, you aren't going to get a lot of rest. She winked at me, and we both left the gym hand in hand. Outside the gym, leaning on my car, was a man in a long black coat, his face covered by a thick burgundy scarf. On top of his head was a black fedora. When he saw us walk over, he leaned off my car and looked at us. Are you Edward Miller? He said in a deep voice, but it had an aged quality to it. Who wants to know? I responded, guiding M behind me protectively and clenching my fists prepared for what? He removed his hat to show a head of gray and black hair and bowed. My name is Arthur. 
Arthur Quantrill. I have some information I think you'll want to hear. It pertains to a certain cartoon mouse. <laughs>